you feel that the general public don't really see wrestling as an art form? No, I think people see it as an art form, but I think they see it more than just what it was supposed to be. You know, the wrestling ring is our canvas. You know, we paint on it. It's what we use to paint the picture that, that the, the promoter wants you to see with his picture. The promoter says what he wants. We go out there and we uh, give the performance. You know, it's a drama that unfolds before your very, before your very eyes. It means, you know, it's just happening. And uh, it's one of the best, uh, I think, arts in the world because it's, it's, you're seeing a lot of real physical pain. The physicality is real. You know, you're seeing uh, a, a drama, you know, which is a lot of play acting, I guess you could say to it, but, you know, that's uh, where the fans want to pay attention on, but I think that it's, uh, it's one of the best art forms because it, it has everything. You can have happy, sad, and comedy and action. And it's a classic confrontation between good and bad. And you have all four of those in one match. You make them, you make them laugh, you make them mad, you make them sad, you make them happy, and you get them out on the edge of their seat. So. Is that something that you you don't predetermine that that you know, at this point you're going to make someone happy or you're going to make people laugh at us and it that just organic it just happens if it happens it depends yeah. it depends like say you know for wrestling worldwide you know uh, the only thing you really go into you know you just go into the give the best performance you can inside the ring and you play to how the fans feel so if you see someone's going to start giggling, you want to make them giggle because you got to get that domino effect and you got to play that one side of the crowd. If you see that some of them are getting really mad and angry, then that's when you play the drama, get them to the feel for the, the hero and the match. Mm -hmm. And then if you see that the you know that they're sad and stuff, you see them you know, almost literally in tears because they're feeling so much emotion for that person, you want to play it up with it, that they're making the greatest comeback in, in in history, they're trying to be the underdog, like the Rocky Balboa. Mm -hmm. And then you got to give the action to keep their eyes on the ring at all times. But you, I play and cater towards the emotions and the feelings of the fans, how they feel. If I see if they're going to get a response from one thing, I go with it. I try to get that domino effect. When I start seeing a different reaction, I start automatically transcend the match into that pretense to, to go right into that, that, that sense to take them where they want to go to, because the fans want to go somewhere when they see wrestling match. That's why they come to see it. It's like a movie. You expect to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Everybody wants to see the end, but you don't understand the story if you don't see the beginning or the middle. So you start off, and you got to play to what they want, so I cater right to them and give them what they want, so it gets that domino effect, and then all of a sudden the reaction is what, uh, is what we all have the end result for. You know, but I always wait for the end. I don't go for the action, the beginning or the middle. That's the way the fans want to go. That's the way it's supposed to be. But I want the reaction at the end because that's the, the explanation point. You know, the period. That's the end of the, the story because mm -hmm. it's a story. It's a, like you open a book and you're reading the story and it has a beginning, a middle, and the end. You know, and that's what the whole thing of wrestling match is. It's just it's told right there in front of you, and right before your very eyes. That's why it captivates people. A lot of people are intrigued by it, not because the athleticism that wrestlers are probably the most best athletes I've ever in the world. There's, to me, there's no other athlete. I mean, football, baseball, hockey, basketball, give them all credit that they're great athletes, you know. But uh, they get breaks. You know, they get to sit on the bench and get breaks. A wrestler goes in a match. If you wrestle for 20 minutes, you're out there for 20 minutes straight. You don't get a break. You don't get a timeout. You know, you don't get replaced. And there's no stunt doubles. So, you know, there's no cut and take, you know, retake or anything. You got one shot, one shot only at it, and you got to you do the best you can to, to perform for those fans because it means everything for those fans. That's what we do it for. We do it for the fans because it's addicting. It's addicting to hear the fans, you know, cheer or boo. Either way it goes, you can get a reaction from them. That's an addicting feeling because, you know, when you have them right here, and you can bring them up or down or up and down and you got control of that. That's a great feeling. Another thing is it's addictive because it's like the one time you're center of attention. You're the center of attention from everybody in the whole entire arena. And that, that's addicting. The other thing is the pain. Pain's addicting. You get used to it. And 
if you don't go without it for a while, you miss it because the pain lets you know you're alive. If you don't feel nothing, something's wrong. So. Or, or would you say that a lot of wrestlers that have a masochistic side to them? Or? No. I think that, like football players, you know, they're addicted to the same reason, the fans. Okay, they're addicted to that, the center of attention. Because they're right there in plain view sight, and they're addicted to the pain. You can go do something uh, and do it for such a long time, because you know, it's the only thing you're doing, and it's what you love to do. And then when you go and you're away from it for a while, then you miss it. Believe it or not, you miss it. I mean, yeah, I even took some downtime, you know, try to get out from wrestling and everything, and you got. You miss it. I mean, you miss getting slammed into the into the mat. You you miss the guy kicking you and chopping you, you know, and pounding on you. You, you know, so it's, it drives you to come back. You know, it really tests you. It puts you at the test of limits. We take physical abuse out on each other, and another one of us complains. Yeah, how many people can do that? Another one of us complains. We take physical. We just you know go out there and be physically abusive to each other. None of us complains. We shake each other's hand and thank you very much. You know, as a match well done. A lot of trust in that. You have to have trust. Trust, you know, in there all the time. That's what wrestling is about. You know, fans are trusting to have a good show. You got to trust the other guy. He's got to trust you. But the thing is, we also go out there and we got to be brutal. We know what it is. If you're mm -hmm. going to get in wrestling and don't think you're going to get hurt, you're wrong. You're going to get hurt. You're going to feel pain. And if you don't like pain, you don't like to get hurt, you have to find something else to do that's, uh, that's going to keep you from getting hurt or feeling any pain. But almost everything in life, you're going to, you're going to feel pain from something, whether what you do, whether you're mowing grass or whether you're uh, construction building a house, you know, to everything your body has a toll on it. Same in wrestling, the only difference is ours toll limit goes a little bit further because we take the body to a further beyond the limit than what people can expect to get out of your body, so you stretch it. So other than those three addictions, why, why do you want to do it? I mean, it's well, I I do it because it's a family thing. Start, you know, it's, like I said earlier, it started off as a family thing. You know, my dad trained me because he didn't want me, you know, just to be sitting in an apartment with a bunch of wrestlers and not pay for any bills or not clean the place up. So he made me do my part, maybe pay my dues, and maybe pay my part of the share of what I had to pay for. And it's a trade skill, like anything, like any any. It's a trade school that I can train someone and get something out of it, or teach someone and get something out of it, or I can use it and apply it like I'm doing now, wrestling, and get something out of it. You know, you, you want to do it because it's easy money, it's something you can do and you do really well, and you travel and you see and meet a lot of interesting people, such as yourself. And I meet people every day from all types doctors, lawyers, politicians, superstars, and regular people. I mean, and everybody, you know, people, it's interesting to meet different people, different walks, to meet different backgrounds, and to see that there, even though you see a lot of evil in the world, the, the news media pushes that out on TV, so people think it's an evil world. They don't really realize it's actually a nice world out there, it's because you're just seeing a lot of evil on TV. The news, you know, they'll project it on TV, but they don't really say, well, if they were to tell stories about all the good stuff, then they wouldn't have any ratings. People only, you know, nosy and sometimes tabloid world we live in, and you see all the bad stuff, and it's easy to point that out. You know, you can sit there and say, well, you know, uh, this is nice, this is nice, but you see something bad, and you know, it's a good apple, good apple, good apple, rotten apple. You see the rotten one right off the bat. So that's a, that's how I look at it. When I meet people, I love meeting people. I love travel. I love uh, entertaining people, giving them performance. And there's no such thing as a perfect match. It never will be. Because if there was, that'd be the last match to ever will be. And there wouldn't be no more wrestling, would be no more boxing, would be no more football, like, the same thing. And so you always try, strive for perfection, but you'll never get it. So that's the reason why you keep doing it over, just to try to get close to it and try to, to leave a legacy so people can remember you from something. You know, because you got, when you come in this world and you go to live, you're supposed to leave your mark in this world. And that's, wrestling's one way I can leave my mark in the world. So it's funny, you know, because uh, a lot of people, uh, like back home, I'm you know, kind of a local celebrity, even here. People call me by Cuban assassin, they call me Cuban, Mr. Assassin, 
never by my real name. Only my friends and family call me by my real name. And that's the that's the, the thing. They don't see me as, as Richie Acevedo. They see me as, as the Cuban assassin, the character. So the character is very real. It's not. Uh, it's, it's, uh, someone said it. It's like. Uh, for example, you, if you shake hands with Tom Cruise, you're not shaking hands with, with Jerry Maguire, you're shaking hands with Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. But if you shake hands with, with Ric Flair, you're shaking hands with Ric Flair. So there's a big difference between Hollywood and, everything, and, and, and the wrestler. Why do you think The Rock goes by The Rock still, besides, uh, besides a contract deal between him and Vince, and Vince making money off him, but he goes by The Rock because people don't see him as Dwayne Johnson. Mm -hmm. See, they don't see him as Dwayne Johnson, they see him as The Rock. It's because the, the character of The Rock is very much real. And all the characters wrestlers are is a louder projection of what we, what, what we really are. It's not mean that we're all bad. It just means that if you want to be bad and you get the opportunity to do it, that's the place to do it. It's in a contained environment. It's violence that's contained. You know, control of violence. And it's justifiable because, you know, the, the it, there's a reason why things happen. There's a reason why the, uh, things end, and, and so forth. You know. So you got the ca the classic confrontation between good and bad, and uh, and that's the best thing about wrestling. You got conf confined in front of everybody to witness it. Mm -hmm. Then it's just a play out drama. See, so your your dad had what, 18 years in, here in the Maritimes wrestling. My dad wrestled here from 1973 all the way up until 19, in the Maritimes itself, all the way up until 1990. Uh, I, was, you know, I stand corrected, around 2000, 2001, he wrestled all the way up to then, in the Maritimes. That doesn't consider well, how many times he's been to Japan. It doesn't count how many times he's wrestled in Puerto Rico, or anywhere in the United States, South Africa, Germany, England, Korea, you know, Australia. He said, my, and, even though why my dad's been around the world, it's been, you know, to a lot of places that a lot of people don't get to see. I've only been to not even half of that yet. And I've been doing it for 16 years, and I haven't done a half of that. I've done almost all of the United States. I've done uh, Puerto Rico and almost all of Canada. But I haven't gotten to Japan or England or Germany, you know, South Africa or those other places, you know, that I want to hit. But, uh, determined to hit a lot of those places before I retire, you know. But uh, even even Mexico, Dad was there too, so. But that's to show you that how far Dad goes, you know. So they see him here in Maritimes is one thing. They don't realize he's also a legend in Stampede Wrestling. My dad <clears throat> helped produce superstars like Bret Hart, you know. He was a referee originally for his dad, and then he wanted to be a wrestler, and then Stu asked Dad if he could do something with him because Bret was small at the time, and my dad took him and gave him one hell of a match. Next thing you know, you know, Bret Hart's success just went on because Bret Hart was, became Bret Hart. And then uh, same thing for Owen Hart. Both British Bulldogs, Dynamite Kid and David Boy Smith, Chris Benoit, you know, that was a hand there. That was tag team partner with Honky Tonk Man, which was known as Honky Tonk Wayne Stampede. Bad News Brown, which was Bad News Allen Stampede, was tag team champion with him. You know, a lot of people don't, don't know that, you know, outside from that until they go to see a lot more extensive work, they do their homework on it. They didn't know my dad was in Japan and stuff. That's, my dad has a very long history. He's a complete legend in a lot of places he's been at. He left an everlasting impression on people. Yes. You know? And he made friends with many people. He has friends everywhere. You know, and that, that I like that part about Dad and everything because he's smart on that level. He likes to keep friends close and he likes to be in touch with a lot of friends and everything. I like to be in touch with friends and I try to, but sometimes you can't keep up because you're so busy the schedule is hectic. It's not, uh, the wrestling lifestyle is, is almost like a rock lifestyle in a way. And then in another way it's not, it's, it's kind of hard, you know, you got to live it. And, and survive, you know, people see the name, they don't see how you live. So they just a totally different thing, so they can see you being uh, like a rich man, and, and wrestlers aren't really rich. I mean, a lot of wrestlers get paid well, but, and some of them wisely save their money, they do become rich, but in wrestling, you know, you only make money to make ends meet and, and continue on to the next 
to the next show to the next show to the next show. I wished I was making money like rock stars were making, then I could retire and in a few years. That's why wrestlers last and try to go as long as they can because the money's not always going to be there. Mm -hmm. So, even for Vince, I mean, he pays his wrestlers well, but if they, they don't save their money or invest it wisely, it's not going to be there. It's gone. There's a lot of wrestlers that did never save their money and has nothing, completely zero. So, and that happens a lot. And even wrestling has the same scene as. as Hollywood and, and, and rock and roll, you have the drug scene. A lot of wrestlers die from drugs, a lot of them, you know, which some of them I knew. Uh, but that's, you know, to be expected in things. People have money, I don't know what makes them want to go buy drugs. I personally wouldn't buy drugs. I don't do drugs. Uh, I don't recommend anyone else to do drugs either. But, uh, I, you know, I, I just don't know what gets them to do that. You know, I send all my money home. Just keep it a little bit for me to keep myself going and send my money to my wife and two kids and, and take care of them. Uh, but I don't go and blow my money on, on alcohol and drugs. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, I, I do drink, but I don't go and get drunk or get wasted or, you know. So, how did you feel when you know, you'd be home and your dad would come back from after a tour or he got kind of hurt or something? I hardly ever saw that. And dad would uh, never let you know if he's hurt. Dad never showed, if he was hurting, you didn't know about it. Dad, you know, has a pride to him, you know, to, it, it's not, how is it, how is it best said, uh, uh, someone doesn't discuss their, their ailments to other people. Dad never lets no one know how he feels or if he's sick or if he's, you know, hurt. He always keeps the same uh, man, uh, manner on everything, the same attitude about how he sees things, how he lives life. I hardly ever saw Dad when I was a kid. He would come in sometimes, maybe a couple of weeks, sometimes uh, a month out of a year if we was lucky. So and then when he and my mother separated in 1980, and uh, my dad hadn't even seen my, my sister. Uh, I'm the oldest of the kids, he hadn't even seen my sister since 1980. And I have two kids myself, and she has one kid. He's not seen none of the grandkids. And my nephew is going to be. Uh, I think he's going to be 11 next month, and my my son's going to be five, and my daughter turned two. Was there really call, a real calling for your father? Really? Well, I don't blame my dad. My dad did what he could do. He did the best he could do, you know, in trying to support a family. I, I'm not saying it's the right thing for everybody to go do. I just look at this from a level of viewpoint that uh, in life you have choices you have to make, and there's sacrifices with each choice you make. So, that, for example, all the great jobs is going to take you away from your family. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be an athlete, you can be uh, in movies, you can be in, in, in music. All the great jobs, even a truck driver, takes you away from home. If you want to try to be home with your family, which have nothing against that, you can go work at McDonald's or whatever fast food restaurant or minimum wage paying job and you're barely getting by. I, I like the comfort knowing my kids are going to be well taken care of. They're going to have food in their stomach, clothes in their back, a roof over their head. How old are your children? My son will be five in August. And my daughter turned two last week. And uh, but I, I feel comfortable knowing that. And I can, I'd rather sacrifice the little times, the little times you miss out, knowing that I'm taking care of my family by sacrificing that time, because because it's no longer about me and my wife. Now it's about the kids. You know, you got to have your responsibilities and you got to see your perspectives on how you look at it. I'm not saying there's no right or wrong way. Someone chooses to work a minimum wage paying job and be close to family. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the right decision, too. It's just, it's another, I look on it from a different uh, uh, viewpoint, on a different side of the glass. Because I see, I, f I just have a better feeling knowing my kids are going to be okay mm -hmm. as long as I'm working and making enough money to support them and making good money at it. And that's where I look at it. I don't. Uh, I don't tell. I don't think anybody should go and say or think that uh, just because uh, other good jobs out there, and they need to say, well, you need to spend time at home and family. They're right. You should. You're supposed to. But uh, in reality, since uh, in from the past to the today to the present, in the past you was able to work a job and come home and work only one job, one family were working. Mm -hmm. Today it's impossible. My wife works a job. I'm doing this in order to make sure our kids have a, have a future. 
you ever had any uh, major in injuries yourself? I suffered seven concussions, had two knocked out teeth, I had uh, both my shoulders dislocated, both my knees got messed up, both my feet I had messed up and sprained them, you know. I never had no real broken bones uh, yet. I say yet because my career ain't over yet, and uh, you never know. But uh, I've, I've had a lot of pretty good injuries on that, bruises, uh, ripped muscles and everything. Uh, it's just, you know, that's the name of the game. It's, uh, you can't, like I said, I always tell people you can't make an all without cracking a few eggs. So, and that's the thing that people got to look at. It's a, you can't go into wrestling and not think you're not going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt, you're going to feel pain if you don't, and you're going to give real blood. It's real blood. If you don't want to do none of that, then you, I think you should find something else that might be a little bit easier to do, you know, for you, you know. Because to teach his own, so I can go do something that'd be harder for me and be easier to someone else. So, so tell me about the, the match you had with your dad. Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> I wrestled my dad for like two weeks in Stampede Wrestling and Can-Am Wrestling, both of them, uh, under the mask of uh, Satanicus, and I wrestled my dad under the mask. And he was very brutal. I think he was testing me, you know. I mean, everything he laid in was solid. It was about the most brutalest match I could ever went through. He about broke my leg. He, he had dislocated this shoulder. and. Uh, I'm telling you, he was brutal, but I gave it back to him too, you know. And uh, and the, the last match was the easiest one of all. It was uh, the last one I got to wrestle him in was the easy match. All the rest of them was brutal. I mean, it was, he he beat the living daylights out of me, but I, I got my I got my licks in on him too. I'm, I wasn't going to take it, you know, just because he's my dad is a man. I should take it from him. He's a man like me. He's anyone else. I think he just wanted to test to see if I'm going to. Uh, stand my ground, which I did. I think he's uh, kind of proud for that, too. Uh, I had broke my dad's nose in the tag team deal before, too. The beast, as a matter of fact, grabbed me and dad uh, to give us a headbutt. I went completely straight in and broke his nose. Gave him two black eyes and a broken nose. It was back to the Legends tour? Was yeah, it? back in 99, yeah. It was the first show I did in Berwick Arena up in Berwick, uh, Nova Scotia. I come out and then I had to jump for Navy Dupree first. Then I go into the ring later on and then uh, Beast grabs a hold of me and Dad both grabs and the Beast is a strong man and he was uh, he was an old man then and he's still incredibly strong. He just bashed, you know. So it's not like we had much I didn't we had much control. So your dad would have been like sixty. Dad's dad uh, at right, that time Russell. Dad was in his fifties in the ninety nine uh, dad sixty three. So he was 50 some years old. Beast was in his 60s at that time. Leo Burke was there too. His knees were gone. He still got in the ring to do a couple of uh, matches, which I feel honored because when I started in 1989, I got to, uh, as the Super B, you know, at the mask, I was his tag team partner against Eddie Watts and Pat Brady. And then later on, I was tag team with my dad and uh, 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 at that time, Wildman Austin, but you know, and his Wildman uh, Williams or uh, Bad Boy Gary. Uh, uh, Gallant or Gary Williams, and uh, we went against uh, the Beast, Leo Burke, and Rene Dupree, and got to wrestle Leo then, right off the bat, which, you know, he's a legendary name in wrestling, not just from my standpoint, just from other people's too. Uh, he was a, just a very good wrestler because he got to be around the whole entire territories. My dad too, but Leo was more in, in the territories so it was kind of honored to wrestle him and honored to wrestle the Beast. It was uh, so what, exactly what's, with that. What's so special about Leo? Why? Why? I think Leo's psychology in the ring is tremendous. Uh, he tells a good story, and he's one of the best babyface sellers I've seen besides Hulk Hogan. And it takes a it takes a good person to sell a babyface character, and Leo Brook was one of those uh, guys that knew how to get the fans to cheer for him. They, we really wanted to cheer for him, same as Hulk Hogan. It takes that kind of a character to uh, to make a good uh, psychology to a match to tell the story. And that's what I like about Leo. That's the thing I think everybody likes. It's not just he can wrestle you. His psychology is great in the ring, but he's a great seller. He knew how to get the fans to ride behind him, cheer him, to get him come to his feet, to get that big comeback at the end and win. That's what I like about Leo.
even then, it was, it, in his age, he still had the fans behind him. The Beast too, um, and my dad too. He was, uh, you know, they loved my dad. They loved to hate him, but they respect him. So my dad got the ultimate respect from rest of the team. Time and I'm trying to think back before the Legends tour, when your your dad sort of paired up with Leo the Beast. Your dad turned baby tag team face. champions. Yeah, here. Yeah, that's right. Tag team champions. They were tag team champions here, and uh, and it worked well here. You know, fans love my dad. Uh, it's a, he's a character, same character I portray. It's the same, you know, same thing. People in wrestling, people don't like to see manufactured stuff. You don't want to see the same production or something trying to outdo what it's already been done. People want to see difference, like a rainbow. Rainbow wouldn't be a rainbow if it didn't have the, all the different colors. And to me, that's how I look at wrestling. You got to have all the different colors there for people to be interested. And you got to have them all on that one show. You can't just have them all look like they came out of the beef factory. You got to have them all shape sizes, different characters. You know, uh, good talkers. You got to have ones that don't talk. You got to have guys that can wrestle. You got to have guys that can do high flying. You got to have guys that do lucha libre. And you got to have guys that do the multiverse wrestlers that work all combinations. You know, you gotta have that variety. That variety is what gets the people. I think that's what draws them. You know, M&Ms would be M&M if it didn't have color. You know, so that's how you look at it. Is just you gotta have that variety. So the maritime scene. That's I mean, right over. I can still smell the the arena when I was a young young person. And people haven't forgotten it. No. Yeah. no. It's funny, I see the shows now, the people growing up, a lot of them think I'm dad. And it's kind of funny, and I get a stand ovation some places I go. Uh, I don't, some of them don't realize they're not cheering the, the, the real Cuban, they're cheering the Cuban son. The, and, but after a while, when I realize it, they all come talk to me, and they can't believe I look like dad, because I looked identical to him at, at, when he was my age. And uh, everything's the same. But uh, and I have uh, people come up all the time, especially kids. And the kids, uh, you know, they bring their kids now to see the wrestling. It's kind of funny on how, how it is, you know, I'm a son of a wrestler, of a, a, the Cuban assassin, and everybody sees me as the Cuban assassin, and they got their kids coming to see you. So it's like a never-ending story, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, my son don't look like me. He looks like his mother. Which so uh, he would probably be the first Cuban heartthrob if he ever goes to be a wrestler. So you know, because he's he's going to be a handsome man anyway. So I just I think I, I'm the only one who looks like dad. It's just amazing that me and dad and we don't even act like father and son. We act like uh, brothers. That's how me and my father our, our relationship is. We're more like brothers than we are father and son. You know, and uh, kind of like it that way anyway because he was he couldn't be there when my mother was raising me and everything. She did the best job she could, and Dad did doing the best job to support the family by working. And uh, but I just you know it this works better for us to be like brothers instead of being father and son all the time. And so the people believe we're brothers, but they don't believe we're brothers. But then people know the truth. But I have people ask me about Dad, and I think a lot of shocked that he's still alive. But uh, Dad's a tough old, uh, he's a tough man, you know. Uh, is, uh, my grandmother didn't die until she was 90 some years old. Hmm. So and she died from cancer, and she's and they let no one know that she was in pain. No one knew until after she died. No, was you, did you say your grandfather was a wrestler? Or? No. Uh, uh, now uh, my uncle was a wrestler. Uh, not the one, not the other Cuban assassin everybody seen my dad with. Mm -hmm. My uncle was only wrestling in Puerto Rico, and he was to call Cyclone Acevedo. That's how you actually pronounce her last name. He wore a mask. You know, he only wrestled a short time and got a back injury and ended his career. He was wanting to come to the States. My dad wanted to bring him to the States as his tag team partner, but his wife says she would leave him. My aunt says she would leave him, and so he stayed and uh, did the family thing. How's the, how's the scene in Puerto Rico now? Well, for Carlos Colon, the scene's pretty bad. Uh, for his opposition now, Victor and Salvio Vega, they're doing extremely well. But uh, Carlos is pretty much drowned. He, he, he don't even draw 50 to 100 people now to a show. So he, he went from a, a legendary company to uh, a more or less an independent show, and, uh, which I feel bad for that because I actually personally like Carlos. 
the spite still owes me money from my last tour down there, but all respects goes to him, you know, he's a very nice man, he's very kind, uh, I hate to see it because he's a legendary wrestler, legendary name, and a legendary promoter, I hate to see, you know, something like that happen to him, and I can only wish the best for him, and I can only hope that maybe he can find some way to save his company to bring it up, but uh, it's not good for him, but the IWA Puerto Rico is doing pretty good. But, uh, and they have a couple other small and independent groups there. It's hard to believe one little island they got so much wrestling, but uh, you know, it, 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 it's kind of sad to see that because I hate to see something that's legendary. And I, and I think anything legendary should be considered historic and should be saved. Uh, like uh, the United States government saves Amtrak just because it's a pastime heritage of the railroad. And I think the same thing should be for wrestling. I mean, I don't like to see companies, you know, close down like Stampede Wrestling. The Stampede now is not the Stampede it was. No. Uh, Stampede now, you know, is a is a is a good product they got uh, and everything. You know, I was there. Harry Smith is the wondrous kid, a great friend of mine, wondrous when he was 15, he was skinny then. Now he's big, but he's he's like Renee. He's just right natural to it. You know, him and Renee's. Uh, uh, and uh, Carlito too, I know Carlito, but I know him as Carly from Puerto Rico, and I wrestled his brother Eddie all the time down there. Those guys are naturals too, so. Uh, but I think Eddie's a better wrestler than Carly, uh, Carlito. Carlito's a good talker, Eddie's a better wrestler. Uh, Renee's a phenomenal, he's a phenom, as, as far as I'm concerned, for a young guy to be that big, that strong, and to ha have such good talent as a wrestler. and. Uh, Harry Smith, I think he's just a complete wonder. I mean, because uh, he, he can do anything. And he's just amazing. So but I like them all. They're all good friends of mine, including Teddy Hart, despite what people say about him. He's a good friend of mine, too. But, uh, you know, Teddy, Teddy Hart's the kind of person, uh, if you meet him, you either like him or you don't like him. You either get along with him or you don't get along with him. But I've always got along with Teddy, and I have nothing bad to say about him because he's been pretty cool good guy as far as I'm concerned but everybody else has their own opinions and so I just leave those to themselves about that because you know Teddy's Teddy. Uh, do you want to